There are new Stuff Plus numbers on Fangraphs, and we are here to talk about them. Why? Well, because Stuff Plus is one of the single most powerful tools we have in predicting pitcher success. But wait, what if there's something in the public consumption of this metric that we're missing and it prevents us from seeing the full picture of how powerful it could be? Well, in this video, we're going to dig into what goes into the model, some pitchers that stand out, who grades the highest, and then we'll touch on that idea. What is missing from our understanding of Stuff Plus? The first part of this video is going to be a bit nerdy, but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. And if you're not interested, I encourage you to skip ahead to the next chapter where there will be less nerd and more fun. What Stuff Plus is trying to do is model how a pitch will perform based on how the characteristics of that pitch have performed in the past. It considers things like velocity and the release height of a pitch, the two most important variables when determining a pitch's quality. It also looks at the resulting break of a pitch, both vertically and horizontally, spin rate, the new arm angle stack cast metric, and a whole lot more. The shepherd of Stuff Plus, Eno Saris, who is a writer for The Athletic and a good friend, has brought this metric into the public view with his coding savants, one of which now works for the Dodgers, no surprise. It's my understanding that this most recent update of Stuff Plus, which is live on Fangraphs right now, includes a new process for actually getting to that final number you see on a player's page. Eno posted this fancy graphic on Twitter to show this. I'm going to give a crude explanation here because I'm a modeling novice. In prior iterations of Stuff Plus, there was one funnel to get to these red squares or outcomes of an individual pitch, which allows you to historically see how a certain thing performed. In this new model, there are now multiple models that funnel into each of these outcomes, which are separated out. Creating these mini models achieves a few advantages. Number one, it allows you to predict individual components like what is the expected whiff rate on this pitch or the expected home run rate of this other offering. And number two, it's more predictive. It does a better job of predicting pitcher success. Here's a fancy matrix that shows, okay, if I'm trying to predict a pitcher's 2024 ERA using 2023's data, which metric should I use? A higher number is better. This new version of Stuff Plus does a fantastic job, notably better than last year's version by an increment of about 20%. So now that we know Stuff Plus is useful, why don't we look at some pitchers? Who stands out in this update? What we're looking at here are the top 10 starters in Arsenal Stuff Plus. And this has a pretty strong connection to the most aggressively projected starting pitchers for the 2025 season. Garrett Crochet, Paul Skeen, Zach Wheeler, Corbin Burns, Dylan Cease, maybe a few exceptions in Aaron Savali and Carlos Rodon, but overall, I think it checks out. This column here, which I called Arsenal Stuff Plus, is a number that is calculated by looking at the individual pitch quality based on Stuff Plus, and then multiplying it by how much the pitcher uses that individual pitch. And if you look through this data, you'll see a bias towards sliders, which Stuff models generally love. This is partially responsible for the push the league has seen to throw a lot more sliders over the past few years. And while starters are still chipping away at the valley for fastball usage, relievers adopted this throw your best pitch a lot motto pretty seamlessly. This is why when you cut the inning threshold for Stuff Plus down to 40, you get a fresh new top 10 with much higher Arsenal Stuff Plus numbers than the starters we were just looking at. That's mainly because all these guys throw some kind of non-fastball nearly 50% of the time. This is why I find a lot of value in looking at stuff numbers on an individual pitch basis on top of this total arsenal number that is considering usage. Take four-seam fastballs, for example. The AL East is loaded with good fastballs. Seven of the 11 best four-seamers last year per Stuff Plus are going to be in the AL East this season. If we hop over to splitters, we can see the Mariners have a near monopoly on that pitch at an elite level, slotting three starters into the top four of splitter quality. So even though I love the conspiracy that the Mariners starters are only good because their batter's eye is slanted, Stuff Plus isn't really buying that narrative. We can even look at this stuff on a team level as well. Here are just some pure averages of starters last season for each team, and we see some relatively expected results. 
The bottom five teams in Starter Stuff Plus last year all make sense. They haven't really performed too well and generally considered to be behind the curve on the pitching development side of things, with the exception of the Guardians, who admittedly are a pretty funky organization. And the top five teams check out as well. Pirates probably buoyed a bit by Paul Skeens and Jared Jones. With all my praise for Stuff Plus, I will be the first to point out that it has some flaws, which you've probably realized as you look through it. You just gotta understand what exactly it's telling you and where you could get other information about a pitcher that will allow you to understand why he's good. Here, for example, is a smattering of six pitchers that I think we could all consider good, let's say projected as top 50 starters in baseball, so around two and a half fan graphs war in a given season and they all clock in with below average stuff. Now, are they doing other things in order to receive those good projections? Absolutely. Snell, Gray, and Yamamoto all have strong command, which we can approximate through the metric location plus, which is in this column right here. In the case of Seth Lugo, he's throwing a bunch of different pitches, similar to a guy like Chris Bassett. Sean Manaya is a lefty, which this model update seems to do a better job of adjusting for. Last year, I thought it routinely undervalued pretty much everything left-handed, but it still might be missing something in lefties from a deception standpoint. My gut says that you can beat your stuff plus most often by excelling at one or more of a few traits. The first is deception, which I really think is tied most often to left-handed pitchers and weird angles or looks, so to speak. To me, it's probably one of the most overused words to give someone credit for having either a good repertoire or success. Command, which we just saw in relation to guys like Yoshinobu Yamamoto, and mix, which applies to guys like Seth Lugo. I look at Stuff Plus a lot, especially when I'm first looking at a pitcher, just to baseline my understanding of what he does from a velocity shape and release perspective, or if I'm checking back in a pitcher that I haven't looked at it in a while. But it's a finicky thing where the more results you have on a pitcher, the less relevant I think it is to look at something like Stuff Plus and use it as a powerful driver of your belief in that pitcher. Think of Kevin Gossman. He doesn't have exceptional command by location plus, although his walk rates have been historically good. He doesn't really have amazing stuff. And from 2021 to 2024, he's been the third most valuable pitcher in all of baseball. Even if you bake in some regression because he's 34 years old, nobody on the planet is projecting him to have an ERA worse than league average, despite Stuff Plus saying that he has below average stuff. One of the biggest positives of Stuff Plus is that it's very powerful in small samples. When I was doing some MLB draft prep last year for my coverage on MLB Network, what I was doing with pitchers was taking their shapes, release, velocity, et cetera, that they had in college and running it through a very crude stuff model just so I had a basic understanding of how their present stuff, even with a different baseball in college, which had some basic influence on shape, et cetera, would fare in the major leagues. This allowed me to create almost a level of confidence when I was asked whether this guy had good stuff. Because let me tell you, one of the most overused phrases, I think, in amateur analysis or even minor league analysis is saying a guy has really good stuff when in reality it's more average. This brings me to what I was teasing at the beginning of this video. There's something we're missing about Stuff Plus in public analysis. And to me, it's that I see three uses for Stuff Models that I actually think trump the established MLB starter grading use of the metric that we spent a lot of time on in this video. Number one is that it's really powerful in small samples. Now I just mentioned this, but I think it's applicable because I would love to see it used in minor league analysis. I think it would cut through a lot of the noise that results create below the major leagues. The problem is just that the minor league shape data necessary to build public models like this is not available publicly, although I hope someday it will be. The second best use of Stuff Plus as a metric is probably with relievers, as I mentioned before, again, where you don't have to consider things like command and sequencing and depth of mix as much. The story that Stuff is telling in those cases is much clearer. And the third use that is probably the most relevant to organizations is in off-season pitch design. One of the first Stuff models actually came out of driveline baseball. There's an anecdote in Eno Saris's piece, which I'll link to in the video description on Stuff Plus, where he talks about how a former pitcher, now coach for the Dodgers, Brandon Bailey, asked whether he should throw his curveball harder or his slider with more movement if tasked with choosing one of those pitches. Stuff Plus is literally designed to answer that exact question, probably better than any other questions. 
I think back to these stuff plots from Driveline Baseball where it literally shows you where to make your pitch better, whether it be moving the movement towards the red where it will be a more productive offering or pushing the velocity up, which a lot of the time is just going to drive the grade of the pitch up. So we kind of exist in an odd time with Stuff Plus where the highest utility I see is in amateur or college or minor league analysis of a pitcher and trying to baseline that guy relative to major league pitchers. When in reality, the most visible Stuff Plus is, is probably alongside major league starting pitchers where we have some track record. Maybe it's not totally relevant to analyze that pitcher using that metric. But at the end of the day, despite that, I do think the value in Stuff Plus is helping everyone in baseball understand and talk the language of pitchers, which is through short form movement and release and angles you're creating and velocity and how all those things sum up together. That is really, to me, one of the biggest utilities of understanding the metric, such that even if it's not as powerful as something like Sierra or skills independent ERA, which is a really predictive metric, or even as something as simple as just K minus walk rate, this allows you to open up a new language of conversation. It has for me in clubhouses talking to pitchers and especially coaches who all speak this language. It's really advanced the public understanding of what is going on when a pitcher is throwing the ball and what happens on the way to the play. So that's why I love Stuff Plus. I just think maybe we need to contextualize it a little bit better in terms of how we're using it and understand the other possibilities that are being used internally in organizations to make pitchers better. So I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, thank you for watching.